A reading from the second book of Samuel. Nathan said to David, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king of Israel. I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your Lord's house and your Lord's wives for your own. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were not enough, I could count up for you still more. Why have you spurned the Lord and done evil in his sight? You have cut down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own, and him you killed with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah to be your wife. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan answered David, The Lord on his part has forgiven your sin. You shall not die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brothers and sisters, we who know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. For through the law, I died to the law that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, yet I live, no longer I, but Christ lives in me. In so far as I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who has loved me and given himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. A Pharisee invited Jesus to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. Now there was in that city a sinful woman who learned that he was at table in the house of the Pharisee. Bringing an alabaster flask of ointment, she stood behind him at his feet and she wept, and she bathed his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and anointed them with the ointment. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him and that she is a sinner. Jesus said to him in reply, Simon, I have something to say to you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people were in debt to a certain creditor one owed 500 days wages and the other owed 50. Since they were unable to repay the debt, he forgave it for both. Which of them will love him more? Simon said in reply, the one I suppose whose larger debt was forgiven. He said to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I entered your house, you did not give me water for my feet but she has bathed them with her tears. She has wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she has not ceased kissing my feet since the time I entered. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. So I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven because she has shown great love. 
but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. The others at table said to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. The Gospel of the Lord. In light of today's event, it's probably better to, to go around the planned introduction to set up the concept of what we're talking about here, but I would just ask you to go at it in a slightly different way. You know, we have the labyrinth out in the yard there, right? And in a matter of fact, it was just in New Jersey Magazine that we have one of the best labyrinths anywhere in the state of New Jersey, good for us. But you know, the labyrinth is approached in many different ways, and it gets back to the spiritual practice of, that so many of our, our great mystics and everyday mystics talk about. That is the purgative way in and the illuminative way out. That is the purgative way in, the illuminative way out. That in the quest for holiness, the first step is to recognize our need for grace. And after we've gotten that squared away to some extent, when we become aware of our total dependence on God's grace, then we can start the illumination process. But until we, get, until we go through that purgative process of recognizing I'm a sinner, I need God's help, there's not much in the way of illumination. That process of the purgative way in and the illuminative way forward, let's call it, is something that's replicated every time we go to Mass. As soon as we make the sign of the cross, what's the first thing that happens in the course of the Mass? What's the next thing we do? The Lord be with you and also with you, and then the priest might introduce the readings, but then the, what's, what's the very next thing that happens? Right, the penitential rite, right? Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Is it an accident or just a funny turn of events that we do the penitential rite, that is the purgative moment before we start into the illuminative moments of the Scripture and the Eucharist? Not at all. That's the way of holiness. For those of you who made the spiritual exercise, you know that the same thing happens in really profound retreat experiences that the first thing you do in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which we'll be doing here next year, the first thing you do is go through the, what, they call the, what we call the first week of the spiritual exercises. And in that, you really have to focus in on your own sin and your need for God's help. You see, in every generation, in every season, the best and the brightest spiritually among us remind us the first step of spiritual wisdom is to obtain or at least to move toward a healthy and inspired sense of your own sinfulness. Not an erotic sense, not one of these flagellation things, not one of these things about, you know, woe is me and I'm doomed and I'm the worst thing. That, that's not of God. That's just, that's just bad. It's that inspired sense of our own sinfulness that really is the gift. And I'll go back to it to the, for the thousand and second time, when they asked the Pope, who are you? His answer was, I'm a sinner who's called by God's grace to serve his church. Bingo Francis. That question of getting to an inspired sense of our own sin is the question in the readings today, and it's a question that in the light of today's events we pick up and examine in a slightly different way. David had a hard time getting to that inspired sense of his own sin. In the first reading today, we have David at a moment when, you know what? The prophet Nathan has just told him, reminded him, David, here's the deal. I gave, the Lord gave you the kingdom. The Lord gave you this palace. The Lord gave you victory in battle. The Lord has given you everything you want. And you turned against the Lord. What's that about? In the preceding chapter, just before the one we hear tonight, is the story of David and Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite was married to Bathsheba. David develops, let's call it since it's a mixed crowd, it's, David develops a crush on her. And in order to act out on this crush, which he's already done, unfortunately, he has Uriah the Hittite killed so he can marry Bathsheba. Nathan is aware of this. He goes to David again in the preceding chapter to what we hear tonight and says, David, here's a story. 
there's, there's this really rich guy and he had a whole bunch of lambs, tons and tons of lambs. He had more lambs than you knew what to do with. And there was a poor guy down at the bottom of the hill and he only had one lamb. And the rich guy had some people coming over for dinner. So you know what he did? Rather than kill one of his own lambs, he went down to the poor guy's house and snatched up his one lamb that was also the family pet and his kid's best friend and ate at the table and everybody loved this lamb. And he took that little lamb and he cut its head off and he served it for dinner. David, what do you think we should do with the, with the rich man? David goes off the handle. We, this guy should be punished. He needs to be pay it back. This is disgusting. This is horrible. This is wretched. And Nathan lays him out in four words. David, that man is you. David, you're the one who had everything going for him. You had received every gift that God could give. And what do you do? You have Uriah the Hittite killed by the Ammonites? So you can marry his wife, David? That's absolutely an abomination. You think that you've done all these things that you've achieved in your life? No, David, you know what? You're missing that sense of sin because you've, you've, really, you've really messed up. And as a matter of fact, David, God is so uh, wigged out by what you've done, God is going to end your term as king. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. David comes clean. Good for David. I have sinned against the Lord. And David doesn't say, I have sinned against the Lord, therefore I'm imperfect, therefore I can no longer be king of Israel. I have sinned against the Lord, therefore woe is me and I better jump on a boat and go over to Egypt or disappear over to the, some peninsula that nobody's going to find me on, right? He doesn't go to that place. That's not an inspired sense of sin. That's stupidity. The inspired sense of sin says, you know what, I'm a sinner and I am called and I am loved. If you want to know about inspired sense of sin, just read the Pope. He got it. He totally gets it. David didn't get it. But now David does get it. And he says, you're right. You're right. I'm a mess. But then Nathan says, you know what, David? The Lord's going to let you keep being king. He's not going to wipe you out. Once, once you can acknowledge your sin, David, you can, you can stay in the game. But until you do that, you can't. In the gospel today, the woman who's the sinful woman, we know what her profession is. It's the oldest one in the world. It's probably not Mary Magdalene. Might be, probably not. She shows up at the house where Jesus is. And who's hosting this dinner party? The Pharisee. The Pharisee sees the woman come in. Jesus is supposed to be so smart, right? And he says he's letting that sinful woman touch his feet. What's with that? He must not know. He must not be so smart after all. Does the Pharisee have that inspired sense of sin? Because you know what? Let me ask and answer the question. He doesn't. He's saying that person is sinful and that person is completely unlike me. He has no inspired sense of his own sinfulness. He thinks he's got his act together. And he couldn't be more wrong. And when Jesus tells the story of the big debtor and the little debtor and all that and who loves more, this Pharisee really is not getting it. The woman gets it. I'm a sinner. I, I need to make amends with God. I want a new way of life. And she effectively, through all that she does, admits her sin to Jesus. He's not trying to make her cry, uncle. He's not holding her nose in the dirt. None of that. He's encouraging her. Recognize your dependence on God's grace. Be a candid king, a person who builds community with an inspired sense of your own sin because Mr. Pharisee you do not have it so lady you go home your faith has saved you Mr. Pharisee you, you just call me when you're ready right because until you get that sense of your own sinfulness and not to let it become overwhelming or neurotic or something like that you're a mess I want you to think about the ways in which the candid kings have been a great service in your life I envy people who go have access to 12-step programs. What's part of the, not the magic, but the miracle of 12-step programs for people with alcohol addictions, with, with narcotics addictions, with gambling addictions, you name it, with food, all that stuff. One of the bits of, of the miracle of all that is people can tell one another, you know what, let me, let me be a candid king. Let me build up this community by telling you about my weakness and what I've done. You think you've messed up? Listen to this one. 
Listen to what I've done. And when people can achieve that level of honesty with an inspired sense of sin, not that that sin is the last word or my life is the equivalent of that sin or that sin is all that matters. No, but it's a piece of my reality and in it I know that I depend on God. There's, there's a candid king for you. The one who builds up community and is rooted in that sense of I'm a sinner. I need God's help. But I'm an okay sinner. And, and God loves me and I'm working on it. David got there. The Pharisee didn't. I got to tell you how much I hate news like today's. And I really hate it and we don't know anything. But when we've seen this in the past, when people do this kind of thing, you know, we've set a new world, a new national record today. Who thought that when we woke up this morning that we'd have the biggest mass murder in American history? But sometimes we know that when people undertake projects like that, it's precisely they, because they lack that inspired sense of sin. thinking sometimes that they are the chosen one, they are the one, they're in perfect, they, they got everything answered, and now it's just a matter of imposing their will on the world. What tradition hasn't done it in a horrible, abominable way? Which, which tradition hasn't made Satan laugh with delight, as the song says? And which of us hasn't done that because we lack that inspired sense of sin. Listen, I doubt that there's anybody here who's going to go out and murder 50 people in the name of some cause. But I doubt that there's anyone here who's never had that moment when you weren't challenged. When you didn't have that David before Nathan moment of thinking, you know, I got my act together completely and I have more answers than questions. And then we need to be reminded. Every, we're not going to be the mass murders, and you friends understand I'm not going there. But you understand that sometimes this thing that we see in bold headlights in the world around us is something that plays out in our own souls in much smaller ways. The sense of I've got all the answers and these people are a problem and if only they could see things my way. Like the Pharisee with the, with the woman. And the best thing we can do is to maintain and hang on to that sense, that inspired sense of sin, to be a candid king, candid with ourselves, candid with God, candid with the right other people. Not everybody, but with the right other people. And it comes down to two questions. Who's been that candid king for you? Who's been that person when you messed up? And it could be in romance, it could be in finance, it could be in sports, it could be in athletics, it could be in who knows what. When you've messed up and you made a bad choice and someone said, you know what, it's not the end of the world. I don't need to tell this to the whole world, but I'm going to tell you, I've done that same thing. And there's life after the fall. I've made the same mistake you've just made. Let me be a candid king. I've done what you've done and I'm here to tell you, we can work it out. The candid king is the one who can build community. The candid king who has an inspired sense of her or his own sin sinfulness. And at the same time, who needs for you to be a candid king? Who's out there going around thinking maybe they're really the bottom of the barrel? They are the lowest belly crawling, gutter living amoeba that ever lived because of something they've done and they need for you to say, you know what, I get it, I've done it. I made an idiot of myself in front of the whole class. I bankrupted the company. I violated this commandment and I learned from it and here's what you can learn from it and together we can form this community that shows us the way forward. You have to think Jesus knew that Peter was the guy when Jesus said, Peter, come and let's get this apostolic thing going. And Peter said, leave me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Man, that's when you know that Peter has what it takes. Candid king. When we lose track of our own sinfulness, we get to doing some pretty wacky stuff. 
when we hang on to it in an inspired way, we become the kings that God wants us to be, to build community according to God's hopes, to renew the face of the earth in ways that glorify Jesus Christ, to stay away from coercion and violence. Who's been a great example of a candid king with a healthy sense of their own sin? And who needs for you to be that right now? So friends, just do the thought experiment. Imagine how the world would be if it were a world full of candid kings. That is, people who built community as kings build community. And in the effort, were much aware of their own limits, their own dependence on God, their own sin, and their own past mistakes that would enable them to say, as the phrase goes, you know, I've made enough mistakes to know I'm going to make a few more. Imagine what the world would look like if it were a world full of candid kings who had a really healthy sense of their own sin and of their own dependence on God. It would be a different world. No coercion, no, no forcing, no jamming your belief on other people. So who's been a really great example of a candid king for you? Someone who included you in the community when you felt like the lowest form of life on the earth and was able to say to you, you know what, I did it. it life goes on. Come on, let's get together. And for whom might God be asking you to be a candid king right now? <laughs> 